Okay, so Sha, can I see your face, please? Okay. All right, so I want to do a few things. I'm recording, so whoever is missing right now can get this information. Uh, whoever has not sent me an email yet, please send me the email right now. Get your phone out. This is the only time you get your phone out in the class. Right now, if you haven't sent me an email with your name, full name in the subject, um, do so right now so that I can contact you if there's any problem, if you're missing something, if you've disappeared, <laughs> right? So I need to be able to reach you at any moment. And I know that your QC email is not gonna be open. <laughs> so I need your private personal email, the one you open, the one you're obsessed with, the one you check every five minutes, that one. Okay, good. Uh, same to you, Zoom people, please, um, emails. Okay, second thing. So since only a third <laughs> did the assignments, I'm going to exceptionally let everyone make up the first assignment, right? So you can just put it, um, yeah, just hand it in, in the next folder, reading assignment, audio question. So whoever did not, whoever was confused, because it's, it's true, it's confusing. Like we meet on Zoom, then we don't meet for three weeks, <laughs> right? So it's, I get it, it's confusing. So. Everybody needs to, uh, if you want, if you want to catch up on the first assignment, the one due today, you can do so. This assignment is the reading assignment and the audio question. If you have no idea how to do those, you need to listen to my first introductory lecture that is on our playlist, right? Every lecture I'm putting on our YouTube playlist, right? So, which you can access via Blackboard. You go to Blackboard, you go to, um, recorded lectures and boom, right? So the very first lecture will give you the details how to do those assignments if you still don't know how to do it. Okay. Um, great. Yeah, also for today you were supposed to listen, um, I'm just talking to those who are not here actually right now. <laughs> I'm aware that you probably did the work, right? For those who are not here, uh, not only do you listen to the first introductory lecture so you know what assignments, how to do them and so forth, but you need to listen to the introduction to Joe, which is what we're gonna do today, um, so that you can be caught up on what's going on. Okay, um, so if any of you ever have to miss class, I don't care why, at this point I don't care anymore. I'm, I'm embracing the chaos. Don't even write me why, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> right. Just join us on our Zoom class, right? If you have to miss class, join us in the Zoom class, be there for the discussion, and you'll get the credit. You won't lose any points, right? That's the way to do it. So see, I have three people right now in Zoom, <laughs> right? So this whole semester, I am accepting that some of you will be paranoid about COVID and will want to stay home sometimes, or you will get sick, family member will get sick. I am accepting that it's going to be, like I said, chaos. <laughs> so, uh, okay. From today, where you have this grace to hand in the assignment you didn't do, <laughs> right, the two-thirds of you. From this day forth, right, I will not accept late assignments anymore. You will lose the, no matter what happens, even if you die of COVID and your sister comes with the assignment late, I'm not gonna accept it, <laughs> right? So no matter what is going on in your life, I will not accept late assignments, whether it's the reading assignment or the um, audio, right? These are the two that are time sensitive. The reading assignment and the audio question need to be on time. From now on, I, I, except for this once, right? I won't accept the late ones anymore, right? Um, but uh, they're not worth that many points, right? Each assignment is worth like one point, so it's not a big deal if you miss. And at the end of the semester, I'm going to be giving bonus two points for everybody to cover emergencies, right? So if you have to miss a couple times because you're sick, whatever, it's okay, right? But I will not, there will be no grace when it comes to the reading assignments and the uh, uh, audio questions, because these have to be, you have to stay on board this ship, right? We are already navigating chaotic waters, so there has to be order in the ship. <laughs> and there will be order in the ship, <laughs> right? So, the, so, so like I said, you can make up today's assignment, but that's it, that's the last time, right? From then on, no matter what happens, don't come to me with some sad tale, your whole family died or whatever, I don't wanna hear it, right? It's, it's, you will lose the single point, it's not a big deal. And you do get, like I said, the two bonus points to cover these emergencies. Okay, any questions on anything I said so far? No? Okay, great. All right, um, so what we're gonna do is get into the class. So pretty much every time we meet is gonna be this format. We're gonna uh, meet here, put your stuff here, and then we'll go outside 
And by the way, no matter what the weather, we'll be all outside. So prepare for in your <laughs> not the whole time. I see one of you almost fainting, right? We'll go outside for the first 20 minutes of class so you can do the um, uh, group discussions, right? I formatted the class so that the first 20 minutes you are discussing together the text based on your reading assignment. So this is why after you've handed in the reading assignment, right, you want to keep in mind your questions, your critiques, or jot them down on the paper, and you're going to go over those with your group, okay? So you're going to kind of, you know, take turns talking, one person will say, oh, here are my questions, and then I'm expecting the group to respond, right? The group should be saying, ah, oh, well, you know, here's how I would answer it, or here's what I think about your question, and then you share your critiques, right? And as a group, you kind of like wrestle with the text together. So that's the first 20 minutes of class, which we cannot do in here because too, too, uh, if we all start talking in this class, it's going to be like such a COVID fest, right? So um, I'll, take, I'll be taking you outside. So be prepared. Rain or shine or snow or minus 40 degrees, you're going to be out there the first 20 minutes of class. So bring raincoats, umbrellas, uh, warm clothing, right? So you can throughout the semester survive the elements. So we're going to do that right now. You're going to get in groups of four, right? And uh, if you like the people, you stay with them. If you hate them, you change. But I want to try the group to be the same uh, from next time, right? So you're going to get in groups of four, and you're going to go outside right now. And you're going to sit down somewhere nice, shady, and you're going to talk about the text, right? And then I'll bring you back in. Now, I need one shepherd reliable person who is always going to be here to bring the group back in when it's time. Who would like to be the class shepherd? This is a, a role, a function, who feels uh, some leadership capacity, who is naturally bossy, uh, who is an older sibling. This is the prototype I'm looking for. Anybody here want to be the shepherd or want to designate someone to be the shepherd? That's fine too. You can designate, point, point at them if you think they should be the shepherd. Yes, you're the shepherd? Ah, oh, I love it. Perfect, the ram. Yes. So you're the perfect, perfect person for the job. So you're our shepherd. Um, so at exactly, let's see the time. Uh, so we're going to do about maybe a little less today because we, we don't have too much time, 15 minutes. So exactly at 5.10, you will go around and rally the people, bring them back in here. OK, so right now, every one of you go outside. Find some people around you, four people. I'll come with you. So I see what you're doing. And you people will be in a breakout room. You heard what to do. So I'm going to put you right now. Any questions, uh, Zoom people? No, I'm good. Thank you. Sha, can we see your face, please? <clears throat> uh, it, my camera light is on, but for some reason, it's saying it's not on. And it's showing my name instead of my face. I'm, I've been trying to fix it all day. OK. Um, all right, you guys are all together, all three of you. I'm going to put you in the group. Yes. Um, so I can't really, like, navigate and uh, get my Blackboard account and my all those accounts work. And I didn't see all the previous time work. So, oh, you, uh, what's your last name? Gavinovich. Ah, you're not even here. I need to put you on Blackboard. Okay. Good. So, yeah. like I said, uh, so listen to this recording. Um, stay after class, I'll um, give you some pointers how to get back there. All right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, stay after class. I miss some stuff. You're right. a mess. Yeah, stay after class. All right. yeah. <laughs> okay, let me get you all in this room. All right, bye, everybody. How is recording? So what is smell? Are we still going to have that? Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> it's like I have to learn you. It will be an adventure. You can talk about it to your grandkids. This crazy teacher. <laughs> <laughs>
try to see how much of your names I remember. So let's see. Uh, Cli, Cli Danis. Cli Danis, okay. Mahmoud, Haj, Iniara, eh, Peralta, Hossein, and Safin, eh, Sarah, don't tell me, Sarah Nakis, okay. Jaskowski, Jaskowska, Jaskowski. Jaskowska. Mendoza, Ramos, Amaroso, Bisuas, eh, Pier, <laughs> you're gonna ask me out. <laughs> Pier Zada. <laughs> I'm cheating. <laughs> Pier something. Pier Zada. Pier Zada. Pier Zada. Badalo, eh, next to Gavinovich. Eh, C. Gold, I don't know, Goldberg, Goldstein, Gold, <laughs> it's Goldstein, yeah. okay, Goldstein, I'll think small, Goldstein, not big, okay, Goldstein, Epstein, Inoyatov, <laughs> and Mishai, okay, and in here we have Ehrenfeld, no, Eisenfeld, sorry, <laughs> who are you, Eisenfeld, yeah, Eisenfeld, Mota, and Shah, right, yes, okay, all right, let's get started, so, just checking, how many of you listened to the introduction to the book of Job? Put your hand up so I know how many of you are aware of what's going on. Okay, good. Um, let me see your books. Show me in the Zoom also your books. I want to see your books. How many of you? So, let's see. If you don't have the book, why? Um, Pineda, what's up? Where's your book? Uh, it, it was book from the Okay, great. So you know that this book uh, you can also find online. You go Book of Job, Google it, boom, it'll come a PDF. So you can also use the or Bible, right? So it's, you can find this book. It's easy, even if you don't have the right one. So this one, you can still do the work even if the book is coming. Who else didn't have the book? Put your hand up if you don't have it. Okay. Abyss, what's happening? It's coming, okay. Uh, what? Okay, okay, okay. Who else? Who else? Yes. You're, you're, yes, you're <laughs> getting your pills up together. Yes, hack. Okay, great. And this one? I mean, sorry, uh, not this one. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put you together now. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Pirzeda. It's in the mail. Okay, so for next reading assignment, right, even if it's in the mail, you can still do it. Just find your grandmother's Bible, if she's that type of person, or uh, find it online. Just type the book of Job online, boom, you'll have a PDF. So do find a Bible, right, at the library, and you can still do the work. So this, this book is easy to uh, figure things out. Okay, great. Okay, let's get started. Let me just summarize briefly what I've been saying in the introductory lecture, because this will lead us into the, the text for today. So remember I told you, right, that the book of Job is not a, how shall I put it, um, standard biblical text. It belongs to this family of books called the wisdom literature, right? And from what I told you last time, wisdom literature are the rebellious books of the Bible, right? They are the black sheep of the family. They are unorthodox, subversive, anti-institutional, anti-patriarchal, right? So these are the kind of rebel books in the middle of the Hebrew Bible. So we know to expect, right, and this is, I think, the problem with many commentators when they come to these books. We know when we read the book of Job, we should not expect orthodoxy, right? You cannot expect from this book for it to say what your pastor has taught you all your life, or your priest, or your imam, or your rabbi. This book is going against the grain. So we should be aware of that as we enter the book. This is not a book that is going to just preach the same old, same old. The, the, even though it looks on the surface, right, it's kind of like an orthodox book about someone who, you know, he was faithful to God, and in the end he made it, right, this is how he's usually interpreted, right, he's, see, see, when you're faithful, I think in Islam he's interpreted like that, in Judaism and Christianity, you have this notion of, see, see, he made it, he was faithful, he made it, and now he's rewarded. We're going to see that this is the opposite of the meaning of the book, <laughs> okay, so the traditional interpretations, in my view, have missed completely the spirit of the book, right? Which is to be original, unorthodox, right? So we need to be aware of that before we enter the, the book. This is not a book which is gonna preach the same old stuff we've heard all along. Second thing, this is a book which is subtle. So what seems to be the meaning actually isn't, right? The author is working with what is called irony, right? He's saying something, and he seems to be believing it, but actually he's being ironic, right? 
and behind is the real meaning. So you have to develop to understand this book a sense of irony. Very often the author is making, is being ironic, sarcastic, and actually the true meaning, and we'll have to be ready for that. Okay, so now, remember I told you in the intro lecture, three sections of the book, uh, the prologue, a, the, poet, uh, the dialogues, and the epilogue. Now, does anyone remember what is the most important part of these three sections and why? What did I say in the intro lecture? Yes, Mahmoud. Yes, and why? How do we know that? Exactly, right? So Mahmoud said the dialogue part is the most important. Why? It's written in poetry, right? The first two, prologue and epilogue, are written in prose. This is kind of, you know, uninteresting, right? It's a kind of a very blah way of writing. And then the author bursts into poetry in the dialogue. So we know the author is saying, here is the meaning, not there, <laughs> right? So if you want to figure out anything about God, about suffering, about what it means to be a believer, you cannot take it from the prologue or the epilogue. I think I made that point super clear in the introductory lecture, right? You're forbidden, <laughs> right? So anybody who writes me something about God based on the prologue or the epilogue, you already got it wrong <laughs> because the author is saying, here I'm being ironic. It's in the dialogues that I'm really developing my theology and what it means to be human, what it means to be spiritual, what it means to be a true believer. Okay, everybody on board with me, right? None of you are gonna derive your theology or your meaning of who God is or what the believer means from the prologue or the epilogue. So today, we're gonna go in the prologue, which is ironic, right? And then we'll do the dialogues and next time, we're going to do the last, the, when God begins to speak, and then the epilogue. So that's the plan for us. Okay, so let's go into the prologue. So I absolutely love the way um, <laughs> this prologue is rendered here. By the way, Stephen Mitchell is not the author of this, right? He's the translator. <laughs> so don't, don't give me Book of Job by Stephen Mitchell. He's just the translator. Book of Job is a, we know, well, we know, we think, <laughs> perhaps was written by Moses, right? But it's a much more ancient book than Stephen Mitchell. Okay, so everybody with me, page five. We begin, this is the prologue in prose. Characters, all the characters are being, he's the, the author is kind of giving us the whole um, landscape of the characters. So we begin by encountering Job, right? So we begin, and uh, so I'll read, right? So once upon a time, in the land of Uth, there was a man named Job. Okay, then he begins to describe him. He was a man of perfect integrity who feared God and avoided evil. Great, beautiful description of his character. Integrity, fears God. And so now we would expect, to, then he comes up with a list. There's a long list coming up to that. And we would expect a list of what? After you've heard that he's a man of integrity, that he's a man who fears God. What, what attributes do you, do you think the author should tell us now to, do, to develop this man of integrity and fearing God? What do you expect to see next? Yes? Like his character traits? Yes, you said, oh, he was virtuous, he gave to the poor, he was, you know, a good father. And what do we see instead? What? Yes, we see a long shopping list of all of his wealth. Right, we say, and, and he makes he, he it's, it's very funny, right? He had seven sons, three daughters, seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred donkeys, many slaves. You can see a list of his possessions. So already you should detect the author is telling us something. Here we have man of perfect integrity, and instead of a list of his virtues, we have a list of his possessions. What's the subliminal message? Remember, the author is subtle. I'm not going to go out and tell you. Ah, this is what I think about Joe. No is subtle. So what is the author telling us by juxtaposing his virtue with his possessions? There is a subtle subliminal message there. What's he saying? What's he subtly telling us about Job? Yes, Mahmoud. Exactly. His virtue is tied to his possessions. So if you're not writing yet, you should begin writing. <laughs> Just say, right? His virtue is tied. In other words, he is virtuous because his possessions are tied to his virtue. In other words, he is virtuous because he knows that if he is virtuous, God will bless him. Which is, by the way, classic message of the Hebrew Bible in general, right? 
Remember in the book, uh, in the five books of Moses, this is really the, the point that God makes. If you follow my rules and regulations, I will bless you. If you don't follow my rules and regulations, I will curse you. So here Job knows this, right? And so he is scrupulously holding on to his virtue, being the most perfect man possible, so that because he knows that his possessions, right, that, in, that there is a reward. Right? And so we are here in the midst of what we are calling here in, in our country, and we are also very much uh, following the philosophy of Job here, the prosperity gospel. Right? It, uh, we are very much as Americans, right? we believe that religion is there to make us happy. <laughs> right? I mean, what, why would I be religious if it doesn't make me happy? Or you know, even further, uh, religion is there to help us be prosperous. Right? If you go to Barnes and Nobles, if you go to the religious section, um, our country is mostly Christian, so you have a huge Christian section. Mo a lot of the books are about if you follow God, right, you will be prosperous, you can build your wealth, you can uh, find your soulmate, etc., etc. So we as a country already have this very close to the job here at the beginning, right? We, we follow God, we follow certain principles, we follow our religion because we feel deep down, this will make me happy. And of course, this book is going to destroy that belief, right? So prepare, if you're into that belief, prepare to have it shattered by the end of the weeks, two weeks together. Okay, so that's the first thing, right? Now look, look even further, right? I, I want to go into the, the Hebrew briefly, just uh, so you can see a little bit more about, zoom in on the characteristics of Job. There's two Hebrew words which uh, I cannot write. Oh, I can, yes. Let's see. Can the zoom people see? Can you see? Okay. I want to write two, two Hebrew words in English, but they're very important. So, first Hebrew word, tab. Second Hebrew word, yashar. Okay, these are important. Of course, you cannot see, the Zoom people cannot see anything. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. Tab, T A M, yashar, Y A S H A R. Okay, so these are the two Hebrew words used to describe Job. Now, tab in Hebrew means simply innocent. He's good in an innocent sort of way. In other words, what the, the text is saying is Job is Mr. Nice Guy. He's good because he had a good life. It's easy to be good if he had a good life, right? So this is tough. It means innocent, naive, right? It means uh, somebody who's nice, but not necessarily particularly profound or, you know, uh, mean, right? Doesn't, somebody who's just Mr. Nice Guy because has had a pretty sheltered life. This is the first indication, first the description. Second one, yasha, uh, means righteous, but also means someone who goes straight, meaning someone who walks the line, right? Yasha, someone who follows the rules, someone who keeps all the commandments, who walks the line, who is on the right path, right? This is Job kind of, you know, doing what he has been taught to do meticulously, not questioning it, not trying to, you know, go against it, just following, walking the line. This is the perfect orthodox believer doing the right thing and so forth. And Job is really, it's not bad. Tam yasha, but it's missing something. What's, what's missing in the personality of Job if you're just innocent and walking the line? What's missing? Yes. Oh, I like that. You're adding now. <laughs> you're adding, you're heaping on Job. It's saying, it says he avoided evil, but doesn't say he's pursuing good. So he's not a Mr. Nice Guy walking the line and trying not to uh, rock the boat, right? Trying to not make any problems. He's kind of a very cautious, prudent man. You're getting already a vision of this guy. Yes. He's not righteous. So Yashar is righteous. So what are you saying? <laughs> what do you mean? I think we had a different word for it. Ah. Okay, so it's not Sadiq. Okay, so wait, tell me the difference between Yasha and Sadiq. Yasha means he's straight. He's going forward. He has an idea, but he's not making an impact. He's not talking ah. to his friends. He's not correcting his son. He's not bothering anybody. He's keeping to himself. So yes. he is someone who affects the people around him for the better. Very good. So he said, just so for the Zoom people, right? Yasha, he's just doing his thing, you know, kind of walking his path. Sadiq actually tries to make a difference. Yasha, just doing trying to avoid problems, right? So Job, Mr. Nice Guy, trying to avoid problems in his, you know, in his thing. So we know, right, that already just looking at Job, he is faithful, but in an immature sort of way, right? He's still very, he's naive. Uh, Maimonides, whom we're going to study next, so you can just look up that word, <laughs> because he's the next one. Maimonides actually has a whole section on Job and that we're going to study. 
And he says, Job was a good man, but he wasn't yet a wise man, right? Why do you think Maimonides says that Job is not yet a wise man? What makes someone wise? Yes, Shai. Although he's good, he hasn't experienced anything before. Exactly, right? Job is nice in a sheltered, some of way, uh, a sheltered sort of way, but he hasn't yet experienced entered life, right? Only when you enter life and experience it do you then gain wisdom. Until then, you're just innocently good. Once you have gone through life, once you have gone through the darkness, now you are wise, right? And perhaps tzaddik, right? So that's that you're already seeing, right? That this human uh, Job is lacking, needs some work, right? And we know that once the suffering begins to befall him, he is going to go through a deep transformation. So now I go to the next part, right? Which is, the, now we enter the poetry, which is the moment that the first catastrophe hits Job. And what we're going to witness, and we're going to look at this together now, is the transformation of Job, how he is shifting through this suffering, what he is becoming, and whether this transformation is good or bad, we don't know yet, right? We don't know where he's going. He doesn't know where he's going, right? So we're going to explore this. And at the end, we should have a good idea of what it means to be truly spiritual. We're going to talk about that because we know clearly in the prologue, this is not true spirituality, right? Spirituality, which loves God because God blesses me, this is not, this is very primitive, right? This is like child, right? The child loves the parent because ah, I'm going to get my food, whatever. Maybe you're still at that stage, right? But this is still very immature. So Job is still very immature spiritually. He has to go through this suffering, and he will begin to mature. And we're going to see what that looks like. We're going to see that. So, so let's just uh, enter into this, this uh, moment of suffering. Right? So he, his first thing hits him, I believe it is, the loss of uh, all his possessions, right? I think also uh, his children, everything wiped out, right? Uh, there is a big uh, storm, destroys his children, all his possessions, his fields, everything's destroyed, he loses everything. And it's interesting, at that moment, he falls silent, doesn't yet speak, silent. And he says, uh, this is a very typical, typical Tam in Yasha. Where is it? Somebody tell me what he said. <laughs> Help me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is that? <laughs> yeah, thanks, but which page? 13? Thank you. Wait, not yet. Before, yeah, 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 before. When he's still uh, in the prologue. Yes. Yeah. Job's still very conservative, right? Uh, lays down in the dust, he's suffering. Naked I came from my, uh, page 7, everybody, right? Naked I came from my uh, mother's womb. Naked I will return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken, may the name of the Lord be blessed. This is a beautiful reaction. I have to stop there because I'm about to destroy it, but I still want to, to look at the beauty, <laughs> right? This is still a beautiful reaction. His whole life is destroyed and he still has the strength to say something like this. Of course, he's not gonna stay there. This thing, this thing of uh, the, um, where am I? Um, uh, may the na name of the Lord be blessed. He has a, he's not going to stay on that level. He's going to explode in one minute, right? But at this point, it's still a beautiful reaction, very orthodox reaction, very, but still beautiful, still meaningful. I'm not going to criticize him there, right? And then he's hit in his own body, right? He has this disease, the boils, right? He's covered with boils. He's just in pain all day, scratching himself, right? Uh, no relief. And at that moment, he explodes, right? And we see that, and that is the beginning of the poetry, right? And it begins, cursed be the day I was born, right? So now he's not blessing nobody anymore, right? <laughs> he's cursing, right? He, was, he just finished blessing God, yes, you, whatever you're giving me, I'm taking it. Now he has erupted, this is a new job. We are in a complete shift, right? From the submissive, God I accept, God be blessed, now he has you can, you can sense the, the drastic shift of personality, right? This is a psychic, psychological shift, right? This is an existential shift. He is not blessing anymore. He's not passive anymore. He has erupted. Cursed be the day I was born, right? And then he begins, right? And you have uh, pages and pages, right? 
of lamentations and complaint and anger and frustration and you know and so forth right pouring it's like he erupts like a volcano that was too much right so as we go through as we read these words right we are noticing that job is changing right and so what i want to do now is go over what is the change that is taking place within him there are actually three main shifts that occur i'm going to ask you what they are right so start thinking Three main, look at the difference between the job here and the job we just met over there in the prologue. Huge difference. Three main differences. So I'm listening. Let's start listing them. Who has one? Yes, Amazing. I think the first one is like just maybe self pity. Kind of pity yourself. Very good. It's less anger. And just... It's what? It's not so much anger yet. Then it turns to anger, right? So you have a kind of, okay, so first thing I want you to write down. First thing that shifts. From robotic, he becomes emotional. Robotic, right? Going through the motions, doing all the right things, like he's been taught, programmed, right? The job here in the prologue is programmed. He knows exactly what to do. He's doing it, walking the line. Now from this robot, which we didn't know what was happening inside of him, all of a sudden erupts these emotions. Most of them dark and negative, right? You have frustration, anger, despair, depression, sorrow, anger again, rebellion, blasphemy, back to sorrow, right? This is an eruption, right? And, you know, many commentators are uncomfortable with this, right? But he is just exploding. This is the first difference we see from this Job here in the prologue, who was, you couldn't even see if he had any emotions, this guy. Tam and Yasha, just doing the right thing, programmed, right? Now all of a sudden, this thing that we didn't know even existed erupts, right? That's the first main, and let me give you a few quotes for that, right? So we have uh, page 22. So go with me to page 22. <clears throat> I'll just give you a, a here you can count from the bottom one to okay one two three four five six do you want to disprove are you there anybody with me just wave at me if you're there okay right he's talking to his friends right his friends already start lecturing him on, on his uh, inappropriate behavior his non-political correct right behavior and he's like do you want to disprove my passion right do you want to argue away my despair? So he's saying, you guys are very rational and you're being very uh, reasonable right now, but I won't let you do this to me and shackle me in your arguments and in your common sense and in your reasonable, uh, in your reasonable behavior. I'm, I'm going to despair. <laughs> this is what I'm gonna do out loud for everyone to see, right? So that's the first difference, okay. Uh, now, two more, two more differences from the job of the prologue and this new job. Yes, Michelle. Uh, I feel like one of them is like he becomes unafraid of God, like he's willing to challenge him. Yes, yes, excellent, right? From submissive, he becomes rebellious or unafraid, right? The job in the prologue is afraid of God. This, he's so afraid of God that his, his, his uh, children have a party. I don't know if you remember this. They have a party. And he's sitting at home thinking, oh, my God, they're going to get drunk. They're going to do some stupid stuff. I better protect them from the wrath of God by doing a nice sacrifice while they're out partying. Right? So he's afraid even that his children will do something crazy and God will, you know, fall down on them. So this is a man who is very submissive because he's afraid, he's worried, he wants to do everything right, right? And now, this is all gone, right? He is talking to God to his face, right? He is up in his face. <laughs> this is a Job from New York, <laughs> right? He's said, gone are the suburbs, <laughs> right? Long Island Job is over. We're now in, you know, wherever, here, <laughs> right? So completely different. He is right there telling God, this is what I don't like, this is what I don't like, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm angry about, this is what I disagree with you about, this is what I judge you for, right? You cannot do this to me, how dare you do this to me? This is what he's saying, right? Completely different, unafraid. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, there's a point in life, I mean, soon you'll get there maybe, where you don't care anymore, you've lost everything, you have nothing left to lose. He doesn't care. 
So he's being fully himself, raw, uncut, unfiltered Job. Right, very good. That's the second difference. There's the last one. The last one, which is not obvious because you said the main ones. Yes, you want to try? Lost. Yes, you, oh, you read my mind. You remind me there. Okay, very good. He, exactly what I was saying, right? From, from clear, he becomes confused. Right? Job, in the prologue, thinks he knows the rules of the game. Okay, if I, if I pray, my children will be saved. If I am a good person, I will be blessed. That's the rules of the game for him. Now the rules, God is cheating, right? He's breaking the rules. He's not playing fair, right? And now Job is like, wait a second. I don't understand the structure of the universe anymore. I don't understand what's happening. I'm lost. I'm confused. This, this doesn't make no sense, right? And now he's in that state, right, of complete confusion. You can sense he's lost. Here's a couple quotes for that. Uh, and then I'll give you a couple quotes for the rebellion. I forgot. Page 14. Make sure you underline these quotes because you'll need them for the test. Just say. Uh, go from uh, the bottom of page 14. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? For God has hidden my way and put hedges across my path. In other words, God has put obstacles on my path for me to stumble. I cannot see clearly anymore, and God is the one blocking me. Right? It's crazy. Crazy accusation, right? So, and then for the rebellious, you have, of course, uh, this is a good one, uh, page 23, just so that you have all the quotes you need. Uh, last, last paragraph, therefore I refuse to be quiet, right? I will cry out my bitter despair. And then speaking to God, am I a sea or the serpent that you pen me behind the wall? Right? And then he continues, uh, yeah, complaining about God giving him nightmares and so forth, right? He refuses to be quiet. So now we have this radical shift, right? From a submissive, praising God in time of trouble, Job, right? To this complete nightmare version, zombie version of, of Job, right? This is Job, this is Job, evil twin, right? Exploding with rage, with frustration, with confusion, with um, a passion, right? Okay, now here's my question to you. So now we can begin to understand how this relates to us, right? For those of you who have peaked at the end of the text, when God uh, concludes the whole thing and he's talking to Job, he's talking to the friends, and they're having this, this, this dialogue, and God is telling Job to do something for his friends. Anybody remember what he's, and, and why? It's a very strange request, right? They're all here, yes, see. Yeah, so God is saying, to the friends who were defending him, right? Friends were constantly telling Job, you know, you did something wrong. Go ask for forgiveness. It's, it's, it's you, it's not God, right? Whole time the friends are defending God, right? Doing good theology. God comes on the scene, he's like, I don't like you all, <laughs> right? Y'all didn't speak right about me. Job, pray for them, <laughs> right? Save these guys, they don't understand anything. Now tell me, it's very strange. God seems to be saying there, Job, you're my man, I like what you did. Those guys, they're not mine, you're mine. So tell me, tell me, tell me, how is it that God ends up preferring this psychotic Job <laughs> to these nice, well-educated, well-articulate friends? What is it that God likes about Job? Yes, I'm going to say. So yes, but, um, it's, 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 so yes, you're on the right track. He went through the suffering. It's how he reacts, right? God, the suffering is, a, is not Job, right? Why does he like Job? Why does, what does he appreciate in Job? Not so much in what Job went through, but in the way Job reacted. What is it in the psychosis, in the psychotic version of Job, that God is like, ooh, I like this guy. You're my man. I like you. What is it he likes in Job? Yes, I know it's then I know that, yes. Not letting his dogmatic presupposition dictate the way he interprets reality. He's kind of he proves himself and experiences both. Okay, very good. I'm gonna say all of them. You can write them down, then I'll put them together. Authenticity he appreciates, right? Job is being real for the first time. Well, but there in the prologue, he's not real. He's fake. He's doing a he's playing a role so that he can get you know his benefits, right? This Job now is authentic, true, uncut, unfiltered, and God is like, yeah, I like that. Mm. Right? What else? Mahmoud. 
Yes, God is loving the passion. Finally, you're alive. <laughs> right? You're not just this little robot doing, right? God is admiring. This is unusual. We're not used to God admiring us when we're passionate, even when it's the dark passions, right? God seems to be, by the way, God is very passionate. If you read the Hebrew Bible, this guy is insane. He's going through stuff. He's just like a storm, right? He's very passionate, he gets very angry, very joyful, very loving to the extreme, and then very hateful, right? So God himself in the Hebrew Bible, very passionate, right? So he's like, ooh, I like this. There you go. Now you're like, we're the same, right? Very good. Yes, see. Yes, that I'll put that with authenticity, right? He he has the nerve <laughs> to tell God, you are judging me, but I disagree with your judgment, <laughs> right? And God is like, ooh, yeah, you disagree. I like that. I like the challenge. This is nice, new, right? Are you getting the picture? This is very interesting. What we're learning here, right? Why God seems to appreciate Job more than his friends is because in a way, Job has finally become human, right? God is somebody who appreciates, that's right, the three things that you guys said, because this is interesting. God appreciates authenticity. He doesn't appreciate fakeness. So if, even if you're gonna be negative and angry, this is, God is like, yes, tell me. <laughs> I wanna hear it, right? Be authentic for God's sake, right? I'm tired of all these fakes walking around in the churches and the synagogues and putting on, you know, fake smiles, right? So in a way, first thing we learn is that God appreciates authenticity even when it is dark and negative and angry and frustrated and blasphemous. He's like, oh, I like that. I, I love a good challenge, right? What I, what I tell my students each time we study the Hebrew Bible is that the God of the Hebrew Bible enjoys a good challenge. Right? He's like, ah, let's do this. You're talking to me. I'm going to ask. We're going to see he answers later. Right? But that's the second thing we saw with Mahmoud. Sorry, what did you say, Mahmoud? Yes, passion. Right? God enjoys it when we are passionate, when we have the whole spectrum, when we're not together. Right? When we're all over the place and everyone is telling you, calm down, calm down, calm down. God is like, oh, I like this. Continue. Erupt. Right? And then the last one, see, I did the. Um, what you're saying, the, the, uh, uh, how do you say it? How do you say it again? Uh, what with God. Yes, the, the challenge, right? So we are learning here, right? At least when it comes to this God here, that there is room, right, for us to challenge, to disagree, to be confused, right? Uh, very often we go through phases spiritually when we are we have for, we have lost touch with the direction, right? We are lost. And everybody's telling us, but here's the path. Walk on this path. And you're like, no, no, I don't see it. I don't see the path. I feel lost. I feel confused. I don't know where I am anymore. I don't know if I believe in God or if I hate God. I don't know if I'm a Christian or a Jew. I don't know if I'm going to stay a Muslim. I don't know. Right? I'm confused. And, and all of your religious leaders will be horrified and be like, you can't, you can't doubt. You can't stop doubting. <laughs> right? Stop questioning. Stop being confused. Let me clarify things for you. Right? And here we're seeing. God is like, oh, I like this. I like this confusion. Why does God like confusion? What's good about confusion? What does confusion mean in the spiritual journey when you're at the state of confusion? He doesn't understand, but he's trying to. Yes, very good. He doesn't understand, but he's trying to. So there's the trying, but the not. What is good about not understanding? Yes. Excellent. Right. If you're clear. You're just going to be right there where you're clear. Confusion, and listen very carefully, this is very important. Anytime you're confused, whether it's spiritual journey or love journey or academic journey, is the sign you're moving to the next level, right? Is the sign you're walking in a new dimension and you're confused because you're leaving the old dimension and you don't know yet where the new dimension is, but your confusion is the symptom that you're moving that you're dynamic, that you're progressing, that you're moving into the next phase. Whether, and in relationships, it's the same. Sometimes we end up in a crisis, everything is confusing, we don't know what's happening. Indication that you're moving to the next level, right? Same thing here. So we are seeing, right, very different description of what it means to be spiritual, right? Basically, what we're seeing 
is that to be truly spiritual, you have to be real. You have to be authentic. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be confused. It's okay to be rebellious. Why? Because these are part of the spiritual journey. There is no journey if you don't go through these dark nights of the soul, right? This is, this is indicative that you're journeying. If you're always clear, if you're always you know, safe and you always know what to do, you're not journeying, you're stuck. I mean, it might be a good place to be stuck. I'm not saying being stuck in a nice place is good. Right. But you're not, you're not progressing. And the, the Hebrew Bible is a, is a text which is always inviting us to move, to be on the move. There's no comfort, right, in the Hebrew Bible. You're always, if you look at the characters of the Hebrew Bible, they're always pushed by God to continue moving, continue moving. Don't get comfortable, right? And so Job was too comfortable. And so God pushed him, right? Bottom line, right, what we're seeing here is that Job has become human, right? He was robotic. He's now become more in touch with his humanity. He's confused, emotional, angry, subversive, rebellious, right? For the first time, he has lost control, right? He's not in control. He's out of it. He's all over the place, right? What we're realizing here is that the path to God passes through our humanity. Can't reach God if you're not in touch with you, right? Can't reach God if you're hiding. Can't reach God if you're faking, right? Being in touch with one's humanity, with, with all the parts of one's humanity, the, the, the shadow part also, right, is what really brings us into the spiritual journey. The spiritual journey, the true spiritual journey necessitates us to be in touch with our humanity. This is so unlike what you will hear in general. Many religions say, no, you shouldn't be too human. You should be pure. You should be chaste. You should be righteous. You should not sin. You should not make mistakes, right? You can't go there. You can't see this. You can't touch that, right? Trying to make us into something high and holy, which is wonderful, but in doing so, often we forget our humanity. And what the text is saying is be in touch with yourself, be in touch with your humanity, with your questions, with your deep uh, repressed anger, right? With your anxiety, because it is as you enter these realms, these dark realms that you will find there, the beginning of authentic spiritual journey, right? That's what we're learning into this, um, in this text. Um, very good. <clears throat> now, any questions on anything I said? Are you getting it? Okay. <laughs> Invitation to be human, not to be angelic. <laughs> very good. Now, next time, we're going to look at God's answer. God is going to answer. This is unusual. It doesn't usually happen in the Bible. It's not such a long answer. What I want you to do and prepare for next time is whether you like that answer or not, okay? I want to hear it. You're going to read the answers coming. You're going to listen to God. And I want you, um, and I'm going to take a poll next time. Be like, how many of you like the answer? How many of you don't like the answer? And so I want you to be very authentic. Remember, you have to be authentic to be godly, <laughs> right? You're going to tell me if you like the answer, cool. And if you don't like the answer, and we're going to explore this very ambiguous, problematic answer that God is going to give Job. Problematic answer, right? And then I also want you to look at the ending. You're going to tell me, is there a happy ending to Job, really? Or not really? I want you to look and tell me if you're satisfied with that ending, okay? I'm going to ask you, how many of you are satisfied with that ending? You'll tell me. Or you'll tell me, I'm not satisfied with this ending, and here's why, right? So remember, we're going to read, it. we're going to go deep in the text, in the subtleties. On the surface, it looks like there's a happy ending. On the surface, it looks like Job is happy with God's answer, but there's a lot more going on, right? In the psychological depths of the characters. So I'm going to ask you that. Okay, so for next time, um, just remember, so for those, I'm just speaking to everyone now, including those who have missed class. You want to make up today's assignment, right, for the ones who are late also, this is good. 
right? You have the option, uh, this one, to make up the late assignments. So go and make sure you all listen on our playlist to the very first introductory lecture where you get the guidelines how to do the assignments. Then you listen to the introduction to Job, uh, where you get the audio question. You need to answer that question. And then you do the reading, you do the reading assignment. Uh, and then, of course, if you miss this class, you listen to it. So you can make up the reading assignment, the audio question, you can make it up. This is important because only a third of you did the work this time. So I need more of you to be doing this. Uh, remember, you're losing points. This is the last time I will accept the late assignment. From now on, audio question, reading assignment will not be accepted under any circumstance if they are late, even if your whole family dies in a genocide in Queens, right? Not going to accept it. <laughs> Because it's only worth one point, you get the two bonus points. You know, there's, it's not the end of, the, of your life if you miss one or two. Um, good. So for next time, we meet in next week. You need to uh, read uh, the last part of Job, right? Do the reading assignment. I think that's it for next week. You don't have audio question, nothing. Just reading assignment to hand in on time next week. Yes. Hmm? Yeah, same place. We're in the dome now. Yes, we're in the dome. Good, so prepare for the next, right? Remember to prepare. Do I like the answer? Do I like the ending? That's the question I want you to think about. Okay, if any of you still have questions, you can come after class. Um, you guys can also stay if you need to say something. I'm gonna stop the recording.